I'm going to speak this morning on the cup of trembling. Now, please settle back and don't say, here comes another. You know, if you know me, if you've been to this church, this is your home church, you know I always end in grace. So if you'll just bear with me in the first half and not get scared, I'll show you that this message is about how God intends to handle our fear problem. First, we'll talk about the cup, what's in the cup, and then how God intends to remove that from our lips. The cup of trembling. With you, uh, would you go to Isaiah 51, please? Isaiah 51. I want you to follow me. I want you to keep your Bible open on your lap, and I want you to please follow me. He addresses Isaiah 51. He says, Hearken to me, ye that follow after righteousness, ye that seek the Lord. Now, this prophecy is directed to the church. This is to those who seek the Lord and know righteousness. Look to the rock which you are hewn, and to the hole of the pit which you are, uh, whence you are digged. Now, I want you to go if, with me to verse 9. Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. Awake as in the ancient days in the generation of old. Are you not him that hath cut Rahab and wounded the dragon? In other words, aren't you, this is speaking of Egypt and Pharaoh, aren't you the one who delivered from the bondage of Egypt? Didn't you deal with Pharaoh and his forces? Look at verse 17, if you will, please. Awake, awake, stand up, O Jerusalem which has drunk at the hand of the Lord the cup of his fury. Thou hast drunken the dregs of the cup of trembling, and you've wrung them out. Would you go down to verse 22? Thus saith the Lord, the Lord. Now remember he says it twice. Thus saith the Lord, the Lord, and the God that pleadeth the cause of his people. Behold, I have taken out of your hand the cup of trembling, even the dregs of the cup of my fury, Thou shalt no more drink it again. I'm going to read to you now from Psalm 75, 8. Don't turn there, but listen. For in the hand of the Lord there's a cup, and the wine is red. It's full of mixture, and he pours out the same. But the dregs thereof, all the wicked of the earth, shall wring them out and drink them. The cup of trembling... Heavenly Father, over 20 years, I've stood in this pulpit and prophesied when you told me to, and I have done it with brokenness, and I've done it with obedience, and you have never failed me. And you have spoken the word, and now, Lord, we look at what is happening in the nations today, and we see it all coming to pass. It's unfolding before our eyes. And Lord, you have placed in the the hand of this generation a cup of trembling. And we see the nations tremble. But Lord, you said we, God's servants, we who know righteousness, we who walk in the fear of God are not to drink from that cup. Lord, we will see and we will understand what the prophet said in that cup. And Holy Spirit, I step aside and ask you to take control of this voice and my heart and the message that it does not fall to the ground but in it lord we remember that you have lovingly shown us the way you've prepared our hearts now lord we pray that we will not tremble when we hear we will not tremble what we see coming but we will hear the word of the lord and we will allow the holy spirit by his own word by from the very throne of god the promise I will remove from your lips this cup of trembling. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now the prophet Isaiah is saying and prophesying that a cup of, a, a cup of trembling will be placed in the hands of the nations. And we see that unfolding before us even now. But he is addressing the people of God, those who know the Lord and those who know righteousness, those who seek the Lord. 
Now, Isaiah is the prophet, the one prophet I believe speaks more to this generation than all the other prophets. Jesus referred to him, Paul referred to him, and look back. And Isaiah speaks not only to his time, but he speaks to our generation. You'll find it everywhere you look in Isaiah. I love to read Isaiah. I love the tenderness of this prophet. And I, 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 I have learned more about God's heart through the book of Isaiah, other than Romans and uh, the New Testament. I've learned so much about the heart of God. And this is about the heart of God. The cup of trembling was put in the hands of the Babylonians. He's speaking to the children of Israel who were in captivity of Babylon at the time. It was placed, though, in the hands of the Persians, the Assyrians, and all the nations of that time. It was a, tr it was a troubled time. It was a chaotic time. In this cup of iniquity, every nation was drinking from it. And in this cup of iniquity, Isaiah uh, outlines, he shows us four mixtures. And remember, I read from Psalms that this cup of red intoxicating wine is a mixture. And the prophet Isaiah outlines, he describes four of the elements that are mixed in this intoxicating drink that the nations of the world are drinking. Then he was not only speaking to his time, but he was, because most of this, uh, uh, some of these prophecies have not been fulfilled that God's, uh, Isaiah spoke to his own generation that are now being fulfilled in detail. Let me show you the four great fears that Isaiah's generation had to drink. And we outline them because they mirror the very mixture. These are the very mixtures in the cup of trembling facing America and the whole world today. There are four of these. And I, when I speak of these, they're outlined very clear in the scripture. You can get your Bible. You can follow me. This is not a, a prophecy that I got in a dream or a vision. This is nothing that came from the flesh. It's outlined clearly. In the prophet Isaiah, here the 51st chapter. All right, fear number one in this mixture, <clears throat> a daily personal fear of losing everything. And there were a fear of survival because of the world conditions, because of the chaos all about them. Verse 13, you feared continually every day because of the fury of the oppressor, as if he was ready to destroy and further on, you fear you will fall into a pit of poverty and that your bread is going to fail. That's what it means in the original Hebrew. There was a fear that came upon the people. Now, I want you to know God's people were sharing this fear. He's talking. He's, he's speaking directly to the, the, God's people. These were praying people. These were righteous people. These are those that are seeking God. But it was such a time and there was such a fear and there were so many chaotic, troubling signs and things that are coming. They're, they're spe they're, they're, they, were, they were acknowledging, evidently by rumors that were coming, that the Persians were coming. The Persians were going to eventually bring Babylon down. And there was fear. They, they, they had remembered the loss of their houses. Some of them were children when they were driven out of Jerusalem and lost homes and lands and possessions and were homeless. And even now, in the 42nd chapter of Isaiah, he, he said, many of you are living in prison houses and, and holes and in caves. <clears throat> he said, living under bondage, you're living under fear. This was the first fear, the, 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 the fear, am I going to survive what is happening? Everything around seems to be falling. There is ruin on all sides and there are warnings and there are fears. Men's hearts filling them with fear. How am I going to survive? How are we? How are our family? The fear of survival is the first element of uh, uh, intoxication in this cup of trembling. Let's go on to the second one. The fear of losing their children to the Babylonian system. And you'll find that in verse 20. Thy sons have fainted. They lie at the head of all the streets. Now, this was an overwhelming fear. 
If you're a parent, you know something of this fear. Their children were becoming senseless to God, forgetting their heritage, fainting on the streets. And, and God had allowed this in the cup of iniquity, in the cup of trembling because of the idolatry and sensuality of that generation. And these, in other words, they, they were Israelites, and now in the Babylonian system, and their children were fainting on the streets. The children of the ungodly, of course, hardened, but now this great fear of losing their children to sin, losing their children to a Babylonian system, their children would wind up on the streets is what it means. The third drink, the third mixture in the cup, frightful calamities and terror on all sides, terrorism. Verse 19, these two things have come upon you, who shall be sorry for you? Desolation, destruction, famine, the sword, terrorism. Or terrorism. Now, Isaiah doesn't give us a hint. He doesn't list in detail what those calamities were. But folks, if you know history, if you'll read, I, 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 I've, I've spent weeks even on, on the study of the conditions and, and going back to the commentaries and what history books I can find in my library. And it was a very, very desolate time, full of destruction and all sorts, personal crises and personal anxieties. And the fourth thing in the cup, and I want you to listen very closely, there was no more leadership. There were no leaders. There were no guides. There were no princes. There was no one to lead and guide. It was a leaderless times. There were false prophets that were gaining personal gain, saying there's going to be peace when pros and prosperity right in the face, right in the middle of all the chaos. These voices rise. Oh, it's peace. It's going to pass quickly, and it's, it's, it's nothing. Don't, don't, don't even concern yourself. There were no leaders. There, 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 there was nobody to guide them. Verse 18, there's none to guide her among all the sons that she's brought forth. Neither is there any that take her by the hand and all the sons that she has brought forth. There's no political leader. They are leaderless. Now these are the four mixtures mentioned in the 51st chapter of Isaiah. And the and then if you look at verse 9, ninth verse, God, in the midst of all this, a cry comes up from the people of God. There, were, there was a remnant in Babylon who had not given in to the spirit of the age. There was a remnant that was seeking God. But you see, it, it was a remnant that was walking in fear, drinking out of this cup that was meant for the nations. It, it, it's a mixture of wine. The Lord said, the wicked shall drink of it. It, it, it's, it is the nations. It, it is God keeping his word. It's God doing everything he said he would do. Everything, all the warnings, everything that God has ever said. There's nothing new to this. And, and God's people are waking up every day. And, and listen to what they say in verse 9. Read, read verse 9 with me, if you will, please. You, you, I hope you have your Bible open there. Awake. I'll read it. You don't have to repeat it. <laughs> it's clear enough. Awake. Awake. Now, these are God's people. These are the righteous people in the midst of chaos. Awake. Awake. And put on strength, O arm of the Lord. Awake. As in the ancient days, in the generation of old. Look at verse 10. Are you not... It that which hath dried the sea and the waters of the great deep that have made the depths of the sea away for the ransom of Passover. God, wake up. This is an accusatory prayer. God, wake up as if God were asleep. God has already promised them his arm is not short. His arm reaches out that he never sleeps. He doesn't slumber. And to this God they had preached and, 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 and preached who he was and and proclaimed his everlasting outstretched arm. And they had been told that they, they could read it in the scriptures that they were under the arms and under the wings of the everlasting. And they come to this God that they had proclaimed, oh, you're the, the God of 
ancient miracles. You opened the Red Sea. You, you, you see, we're, we're just like that. We, we have a gospel of the past. We can, we can stand in the pulpit and preach marvelous sermons. How we talk about how Jesus fed the multitudes and raised the dead. But when it comes to our everyday life, when it comes to believing God for the next paycheck, when the, ble- when, when the doubts and fears come moving in about mortgages and my children and all these things, you see, we, we, we start drinking from the cup. Fear, anxiety, despair, worry, fret. And they said, they look back and they could preach this wonderful thing. And they're telling God how good he was in the past. And basically, uh, that, that's, what, that's what I have been guilty of too. You know, in my own life, talking and preaching. I'll, I'll come up in this pulpit or wherever I'm preaching and talk about this God of the past. This, this God. Thank God for the God of the past. But if He's the God of the past and the God of miracles, if He raised the dead, then surely He can take care of you today. The cup of trembling that was put into the hands of our eight days generation is the same cup that's been placed in the hands of this generation. I want to show you. I'm going to go over these four mixtures and you tell me whether or not this is what our nation is drinking and what the nations of the world are drinking right now. Tell me if this is not the cup of, a, the cup of trembling for our generation. Now just hold on. The same fear of survival, number one. We're facing the worst housing crisis since the Great Depression in the 1930s. In the next year and a half, a million and a half people, they seem, will, will lose their houses. In the past month, January, 50% of the American people quit shopping suddenly. 50%. Nobody told them to. It was something supernatural that just happened. You see, I I picked up my book this past week that I wrote in 2001 after 9-11 about the Holocaust, the economic Holocaust coming to America, for which I was mocked and ridiculed even by those that were Pentecostal. And I, I was reading this past week as... A warning there, <clears throat> the biggest problem, <clears throat> there would be terrorism, but it's going to be <clears throat> a housing collapse in the, in the bond market, says the bond market, because the, those who insure our bonds, these are municipal bonds for cities and states, the bond insurers, China last week bailed out one of our largest insurers before they went bankrupt this week, and if they'd gone bankrupt, This place will be shaken, but that's the next shoe that's dropping very suddenly, shortly. China just bailed us out. China has put $650 billion into our banking system short recently just to save our banking system. Folks, when you know the Bible, when you know the Word of God, you know exactly where we're at. I'm not trying to scare anybody, but in Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter, now hear this. Now, if you say this should not be done, just let it happen. I don't want to hear it. I'm, I'm going someplace with this. And if, if you lived in Christ's days and you heard Jesus say to his church and to the, the city of Jerusalem, he said, not too long from the, that temple you see, that golden temple, there won't be one stone left another. And you see those walls that protect you, they're all coming down. And he, he was trying to warn them, a million people were going to die. A million people were going to die in just a, not too many years, about some 30, 35 years. And folks, God's people, we're not ignorant of the devices of Satan. But let me show you the word of God, and you put this together with me. Deuteronomy, don't turn there, please. God said through Moses, if, 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 if a nation, if this nation and any nation will honor me, honor my word, 
and just turn from their iniquity, but honor my word and obey my word. Let me show you what God said would happen. I'll set you above all the other nations. I'll bless you and overtake. I'll bless, blessings will overtake you. Your enemies will be defeated before your eyes. The Lord will open to you his good treasure. You shall lend to nations and you shall not borrow. You shall be the head and not the tail. Now let me show you what God said. And, and, and it's here. And I don't understand why it's not being preached. God says, now let me tell you what happens to nations when you deny my word and put me out of your society. Let me tell you what's going to happen. He said, you lose control of your children. Verse 20, 32 and 28. Nations shall turn against you, despise you. Strangers and foreigners in your midst are going to be lifted high and you will be brought down low. And think of the American dollar. Strangers shall lend to you. And you shall not lend any more to him. They shall be the head. You become the tail. Your lenders are going to put upon your neck. They're going to put a, a, neck, a yoke around your neck and you will not know it. You see, in just a, less than 50 years, America has gone from the greatest lending nation we lend to the world in foreign aid, and we have become now the world's largest debtor. We have just borrowed in the past few years $3 trillion, and our nation is bankrupt. Now, folks, that, that's not scary. Just... I mean, nobody trying to scare you, but here's what the script, here's what the prophet said would happen. It's happening before our eyes. This is number two. You face the desolation, famines, and terrorism in the cup of trembling. 50,000, I just heard on the radio, 50,000 a month dying in Congo from starvation. Ethnic cleansing in Sudan has displaced 300,000. If you're from Africa, God... Put us, give us a broken heart. Chad is in civil war. Kenya is being terrorized. We were there a year ago in Nairobi. And I walked those slums, half of which have been burned to the ground. Our, our, we support an orphanage in Nairobi, Kenya's kids. And they have taken in 200 of those kids in that slum that are homeless. That's all they can handle. A year ago... In our meeting, almost every tribe, ethnic tribe, was represented. The Spirit of God came down. There was a warning. In fact, our ministry financed uh, uh, what they called unity meetings. Two bishops from different tribes going around, calling all the tribes and all the churches together to pray for unity. You see, God, God is faithful. He always warns. He prepares his people. And we're in daily contact by email for our contacts in Nairobi and all through Kenya. And the Christians, those that are living in this turmoil and in this, God is providing. God is, God is keeping them. And, and they're caring for one another. There's a spiritual awakening. God is doing miracles right in the middle of it. Because you see, when these things shake, everything shakes, God begins to move in and say, now will you listen to me? Now can I get through? to you and he's doing just that Nigeria is headed for civil war there's no question that uh, Nigeria the world is the third in the cup of trembling is the loss of children our college campuses have become dr they're drowning in alcohol and drugs I don't know if you heard this news story. The, the college campus was concerned about a helicopter that kept flying <clears throat> over. I don't know if it was two, three days or a week. A father who feared for his daughter had hired a helicopter to supposedly rescue her, his daughter in that college if there were a breakout of violence. Hired a helicopter because of the fear 
the shootings and those things that are happening on our college campuses. Crystal meth is sweeping the world now. And it, it, these crystal meths are in garages and all over the United States. I, I had a call from uh, a young person that was on crystal meth. And I was told by this young person going to commit suicide that night. And this is what I heard. I said, Pastor David, have you ever heard of chasing the dragon? I, I said, yes, but I said, that's from crystal meth. Because when I, I've been on all the drugs, I've been heroin and cocaine. But when I took crystal meth, it was like 1,000 shots. 1,000 shots of cocaine, or snorts of cocaine. Folks, this, this is the fear that's sweeping America, and it, it, if you're not careful, it's going to get into your heart, and it will overwhelm you. You'll drink the dregs. You see, it's so, it, it's a parent, as a grandparent now, I have grandchildren that are in school. I have two grandsons in one school, and it sits in a, in a pretty nice neighborhood, and they, they tell me, you, there's hardly anybody in the junior senior class that doesn't smoke pot. And, and the, the drinking and, and the drugs. And even our kids here in Times Square Church, how many will tell you how difficult it is to go to, church and find, or go to school and find anybody who knows God, anybody who, who really uh, knows Jesus, and how hard and how difficult it is. And you have to send children out and grandchildren out into this world. And I get letters from all over the United States of parents and grandparents. They said this is one of their greatest fears, and it's something they have to fight every day. They send them out to school and know the kids are going into a, a, an atmosphere of pot and drinking and sex. And, and folks, yes, there's a cup of trembling. And, and I, I, let, me, let me race through this so I can get to the promise part. And believe me, there is. Let's talk about leadership. Let's talk about this fourth element of the cup. There was no leadership. Now, we're in election year. And, and we, we hear the same promises being made that have been made to every generation. Oh, I, I, I grieve for all the college kids and young people today. Now, folks, I'm not... I, 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 right now, if I had to go into a voting booth and vote, I would write Jesus on the... <laughs> I can't see one that I would vote for. But you see, I want you, I want you to know whether a Democrat or Republican, they don't have a clue. They don't know what to do with the economy. They don't know what to do with health care. They don't know what to do with anything. It's far beyond them. There is no more leadership. There is no prince. There is no politician. There is no president. I pray for President Bush, but I, I think he's just waiting to get to his farm. <laughs> I say that in love. I, I think he said, oh, I hope I, I can lay this burden down. In fact, I, who wants to be... Oh. <laughs> Listen to what the scripture says. Let's go to the word, if you will, please. He, he said, there is not any among you. Uh, let me find the scripture on that, please. Uh, there is none, verse 18, there is none to guide her among all sons whom she's brought forth, none to take her by the hand. There's, there, there's, 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 there's no one there to take him by the hand. In fact, he, he, he talks about the sons of the church also. There's not one of the sons of the church. There's, there's nobody that claims to be a part of the church that is standing up and have the answers. Tell me any politician, 
any man, any woman on the face of the earth right now that has the answers. You know, I said, no. you, now you see, everyone, we've, we've got sons of the church, so called. We've got a Mormon, claims to be a son of the church. We've got uh, a Baptist preacher who is a son of the church. The church, the modern church, the, the denominational setup. And then we've got Obama uh, as uh, also a son of the church, Christ Church, I think, in Chicago. Uh, and uh, Hillary Clinton carries her Bible. They all carry their Bibles. And they all love to mention Jesus once in a while, claiming to be sons of the church. Young people, don't, I don't care who you, who, who, who you see and who you're getting excited about, don't get your expectations very high. There's no leadership. Only King Jesus, only the Savior, only God can do this. There's no other hope. There's no other answer. But you see, God comes back to these people who are praying and saying, Oh God, awake, rouse yourself, awake. Where is your strong arm? God comes back. He comes back in, in Isaiah 51. Go to verse 17. Awake, awake, stand up, Jerusalem. Now, when verse 9, awake, awake, that's God people trying to wake God up. God comes right back and says, no, 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 wait a minute. You wake up. <laughs> you wake up. You stand up, O Jerusalem, which is drunk of the hand of the Lord, the cup of his fury. Thou hast drunk in the dregs of the cup of trembling and wringing them out. You see, there are some people I know, and this is a fact, they, they have drunken so much from the cup of trembling that they've drunken the very dregs, meaning they have drunk it dry. That means that they have, they say, I can't handle one more problem. I can't handle one more fear message. I cannot handle another problem because I, I'm going to break. It's, it's far as I'm concerned. I, I have heard even ministers say, I'm at the brink of just walking away from everything. And there are, some of you are listening to me right now, you've been drinking the cup even to the dregs. You're drinking until it's dry. And you say, I can't, there's nothing more I can take. I have taken all I can take in drinking the very dregs of this cup. God says, no, you stand up. Now, God has made a provision, and I want you to go now. Isaiah 20, verse 21. Therefore now hear this. You who are afflicted and drunken, but not with wine, saith the Lord. And you notice he, he calls himself the God who pleads the cause of his people. God says, no, I'm not asleep. I'm the same God who opened the Red Sea. I'm the God who raises the dead. And he says, now I want you, there, I've made provision for you to never again drink from the cup of trembling. This was not meant for you. God never intended his people live in fear and bondage, no matter how the conditions are, no matter what happens in our personal lives, in the nation, or in the world. God never intended his people to live in fear. Luke, first chapter, it says he's going to come and deliver us from, from fear who all our lifetime, and, and he says, to live without fear all of our lifetime. Now there will be pangs of fear. There will be those sudden things that come on us and in the natural we fear. But folks, with what is coming in the days ahead, it, it can't be just coming to church and getting pumped up with a faith message. You and I are all going to have to have something of faith in us by which we stand. If we have to stand alone where there was no preacher, you don't... I got a letter from somebody this past week, and, and, and they said, uh, Pastor Dave, the last few months your, your sermons are all repetitious. It sounds like you're trying to pump people's faith. Don't your readers know their Bibles? 
And, and you, you see, thank God that we can encourage you. That's why we come to the house of God. We hear the word and we're encouraged because God has given, according to Paul the Apostle, a measure of faith to all of us. But that faith has to be expanded. It has to be fed. It has to be nourished. And that is from reading the book, of, uh, this, this book that he's provided for us. He's said faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God and he says to Israel I put my words in your mouth and I've made a covenant pledge to you that I will keep you I have pledged myself I am your God I am the I am not I am he says it twice I am I am is going to deliver you I put my words in your mouth he has made an everlasting covenant Behold, I've taken out of your hand, verse 22, I have taken out of your hand the cup of trembling, even the dregs of the cup of my fury. Thou shalt drink it no more. What is this saying? God's not just going to come down supernaturally and suddenly remove all the fear out of our hearts. Now, folks, I'm preaching this because I asked God to give me something to keep me. Now, yes, I'm concerned about his church, but what right do I have to come and preach it until I've learned something that works in my own life? I have no right to preach it unless God has worked it into my very being and that it's working, and I put it on trial and it works. Folks, you get up every day and you lay hold of two or three promises of his keeping grace. You lay hold of those and you get up every day and the Lord says, Oh, wake up, Jerusalem, stand up. That's what Apostle Paul says all through his epistles. Stand up, be of good courage. And he's saying to those facing hard and difficult times, those who, who took joyfully the spoiling of their goods. Folks, I'm telling you, you've heard it from all these pastors. You've heard from Pastor Carter. <coughs> I have never claimed to be a prophet. But I, I know how God has instructed me. And it's just two or three minutes here before I close. Let me tell you what I see. God instructed me, has instructed me to keep my eyes on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's how Paul survived. That's how his, he, he brought the church through those days. Keep your eye on the resurrection. Power. Of the living God, as if to, as, 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 and it is saying to us, if you can see that power, that resurrection power, what can He do when you're in a condition that looks hopeless, like it's death? There's no hope. Keep your eye on the resurrection. And then, secondly, <clears throat> in this, if you're going to live as Jesus lived and do as He did, as we're instructed in the Word, Acts 2.25, you don't have to turn there. I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not be removed. He said, I keep the face of Jesus before my eyes all day. I keep my face on him to wake up in the morning. To, to, to wake up each day and the cloud is there, the news is worse than ever, but in the midst of all to say, I have committed everything, live or die, I am the Lord's. And, and to go into Psalm 34 and just start quoting those to yourself and to God and to the devil especially and say, no, 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 live or die. He says, he's put his word in me. I have the word, I have an anchor, and I'm not going to be shaken. I'm going to keep my eyes focused on Jesus. And folks, that's, that's what are you going to have if someday for a season, and it'll come for a season that not be able to get to a house of God, wherever it may be. And, and you are there with your family. Do you, will you trust him? You say, I, I don't know. Well, folks, that's what the Holy Ghost is for. It's to ask the Holy Ghost to enable you and to strengthen you. We say this, we preach it over in a, in a hundred different ways, but it always comes back to the same thing. Seek God, 
keep the face of Jesus before you every day. And when the fears come and those stand up and, and proclaim, not just read it, but proclaim it. Say it out loud. Proclaim it. Proclaim it in your family. Proclaim it wherever you go. I'm proclaiming it right now. The God who's kept every generation is going to keep me and my family and his church. Going to keep him by his wonderful, matchless grace. And the good news, the really good news, is that's when God starts moving in miraculous ways to save the backslidden, to save those and all of those who have fallen away, the great in gathering before the angels come to harvest the harvest. When they come and gather the saints of God together, they're going to be multitudes. And it's going to be an exciting day. Folks, I, I'm not scared. I, I think it's going to be the most exciting days the church of Jesus Christ has ever known. And you're going to get excited because you're going to win more souls than you've ever won in times of prosperity. I want you to turn to, in closing, I want you to turn to Isaiah 40, 40th chapter of Isaiah. I want you to stand with your Bibles open. I, I thank God for all the... Uh, all the new uh, interpretations in the Bible. I'm just so, I don't know, I'm stuck on King James, so <laughs> if, if you have a King James, you read along, and if, if you have another uh, interpretation, will you just mumble it? <laughs> well, I'm, because the words won't match. It's not a matter that... I mean, it's not in the same font. All right. Let's start reading aloud. Now, didn't God say, I put my word in your mouth? I would rather you take this to heart than to shout for the next hour without the basis. If you take this, this will be something that will strengthen and hold you. Let's start reading at verse 26. Can you read it in King James out loud? Lift up your eyes on high, and behold who hath created these things, that bringeth out their host by number. He calleth them all names of the greatness of his might, that he is strong in power, not one faileth. What saith thou, O Jacob, and speaketh, O Israel? My way is hid from the Lord. My judgment is passed over from my God. Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, faints not, neither is weary, there's no search of his understanding. He gives power to the faint. To them that have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Glory be to God's holy word. We honor your word. The God of everlasting salvation. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Glory be to God. I heard Pastor Carter not too long ago, I don't know if he said it to me privately or whether it was public, he said, I'm falling so much in love with the Word. That's what it's going to take. Falling in love with this again. And everything that comes up, just run to the arms of Jesus. I keep Him ever before my face. That means running to His arms. Hallelujah. Church, don't be afraid. There's nothing that can take away this hope. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Come quickly. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Now, I was praying about what kind of invitation I should give here this morning. And Holy Spirit 
whispered to my heart that there are some of you that are under the same spirit that they were under during Isaiah's time. There was a spirit of fear that had come. They were seekers of God. They knew righteousness. But it means that when they prayed, they were not praying in faith. And their prayer was, forgetting God, where are you? Aren't you answering? God, why are you asleep? David prayed that. He said, God, why do you sleep? Why don't you hear when I pray? And it's a spirit. And there's a spirit of fear that's in the land because of this cup of trembling. And if you're here this morning in the balcony, here in the main floor, and you have, you've been fighting fear, but it's getting a hold. If, 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 if you don't reach out now in that time of fear and say, God, I want deliverance. I don't want to carry this spirit of fear. That spirit can be cast out. That spirit of fear can be overcome by faith and by the, by, by the word of the living God. And if you're here with a spirit of faith, you're just, you wake up every day. It's there. It's, I don't, maybe you've moved even into depression because of it. God doesn't want you to go out of this church this morning bound by fear. If you don't know Christ, you come with him. If you've backslidden, if you've turned away from the Lord, if you're not seeking God anymore and, and God is just stirring your heart a little bit this morning, you feel a tinge or a tug of the Holy Spirit, you can come. Come and stand here in the front. We're going to pray. I'm going to ask God to break this spirit of, this is a bondage. Fear has torment. It can torment you. And perfect love casts out that fear. I want you to step out of your seat. Come into the front and pray, and we'll pray with you and believe the Lord. Otherwise, just remain in your seat. But only those who, who are moved upon by the Holy Spirit to answer what I've just said. Uh, along with your fasting and along with our fasting and praying, and if, wherever I'm at when this church is fasting, I'm fasting. And <clears throat> I, I feel this very strongly. Along with that, would you make it an effort to read the entire book of Psalms in the next 30 days. The entire book, and get your pen or pencil and mark it. Mark it well. If you have a Bible you don't like to mark, it's probably one that you should give away and get another. <laughs> uh, I'm not trying to be facetious, but uh, read the book of Psalms. Read it and get grounded in the Word because of what is coming. Now, thanks, the Bible says, now, it would be so easy, and we don't do this in this church, we don't manipulate crowds, never. It would be so easy to say, let's just get our hands out, and let's just clap our hands and try to get ourselves in a trusting mood. That won't work. The Bible said, in peace and quiet shall be your strength, because you've taken a stand, you've committed everything to God. I've got some things uh, I'm facing in my family with sickness and things. I, I, have to, I just have to commit. I've committed. I, no matter what happens, Lord knows I have committed. I did that with my granddaughter when she was 12 years old and dying of brain cancer. I laid her in God's hands and said, you're going to do what is right. And I'm telling you and hear this pastor well. God put it in my heart to come here and, have, and, and found this church. And I'm telling you, and you've been hearing it from this pulpit, the times are scary and they're going to get far, far worse than we could imagine. But he said that there's going to be peace in your soul. If you are grounded in this word, and that, that's this fasting and praying and seeking the face of God, but there has to be faith in our praying. It has to be faith in our fasting. And believe that. And I have committed. And I want you that have come forward and everybody that's hearing my voice, make a commitment. God would not ask us to do something that was not within our power to do, especially with the help of the Holy Spirit. Faith is available. Your measure of faith can grow now if you will water it and bless it until you're going to be able to stand. You'll be able to turn to a fearful wife or a fearful husband or fearful children and say, no, we're not going to 
We're not going to fear in this household. We're going to believe God's word and God. You see, we want details. God, tell me how you're going to do it. How, how, how am I going to pay a bill? How am I going to do it? We want a plan. God says, no, I'm not going to tell you how. I got a million ways you couldn't conceive. I got ways you know nothing about. I can keep you. I can, I'm going to put a roof over your head. I'm going to put food in your stomach. You will not go naked. Folks, what more could we ask? Because we have that, and we have eternal life, and we have a walk with Jesus that nobody can touch. <laughs> Glory be to the living God. Now let's believe God to cast out this spirit of fear from all of our hearts. And make a commitment that you will get into the word of the Lord. Along with your, keep your regular schedule of Bible reading, but go through the book of Psalms until you've marked every chapter. Every single chapter, apply it. If, if, if you see some verse, just say, me, me. In other words, that's for me. I don't care what your code is. Get a code and codify your whole book of Psalms. Glory be to God. I think I have every word in the Psalms underlined. Just about every word. <laughs> my kids are fighting to get my Bible when I die. Just... <laughs> I'm not boasting. I'm saying that's how God's kept me and never failed me. We've been through three recessions. I have ministered through three recessions. And I've seen God keep his people through every one of them. I've seen God keep his people. <laughs> Hallelujah. Would you lift your hands? Lord, and I'm asking everyone who has their hands lifted that you will erase every cloud. Every cloud of fear and doubt and unbelief. I come against the spirit of fear and bondage. God says, who are you that would fear man? Who are you? You're my son. You're my daughter. Why are you afraid of man who's grass? Why are you afraid? Who put this fear in you? I have not given you the spirit of fear, but of love and power and a sound mind. So stand up and believe that God is able. Now, we, we cast out the spirit of fear. In the annex here in this auditorium, we cast it out in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, breathe your breath and blow it away. Just breathe your breath right now and come to believing hearts. Come to expectant hearts. We are God seekers here. We are those who are clothed in the righteousness of Jesus by faith. So, Lord, we have nothing to fear. Nothing to fear. Can you say it? I have nothing to fear. God has everything under control. Will you turn to three or four and just say that to somebody around you? God has everything under control.